2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, uh, it reads like this. It says, The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. We're in this series in the book of 2 Samuel, and, and the more I try to, I, I can't. I can't speed up things. We, you know, we, we try, but the story is filled with names, filled with the, a narrative of, of, of David, uh, David's ascension into becoming king over Israel. Now, if you will recall, David had been anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. God chose him to be the king over Israel, but David has to wait. And so the whole premise of 2 Samuel is how did David receive the kingdom long promised to him? And the reality is that waiting takes practice. How many of you like to wait? We don't like to wait, right? There are things that we're willing to wait for, but there are some other things that are like we're done waiting. We, we just want things fast, and we're naturally impatient. And we see in David not only a willingness to fight, Remember when he said, I'll find the giant? <laughs> but he also had the ability to wait, so much so that 15 to 20 years passed by after he was anointed king, until he became king over Israel. And so after he inquires from the Lord, when he finds out that King Saul is dead, he is instructed by God to go to Hebron, where he waits seven and a half years before becoming king over Israel. Now, you will excuse me if I get some names pronounced wrong. You go ahead and give it a shot next week. <laughs> but I don't like waiting. Uh, in fact, uh, I was reminded, and I think I've told this story before, but many of you may not have heard this story. But one time we traveled to uh, San Antonio uh, and went to do the SeaWorld thing. This was before Esteban, our youngest, was born. And on the way back to the hotel, we always like, oh, I said we always, it's kind of like, uh, a tradition, but one of the nights when we go out of town, we like to bring pizza into the hotel room and just eat pizza and uh, watch TV and, you know, uh, go to bed late and uh, pizza tastes better in those times. And so on the way back to the hotel, I was reminded that the, that the car to access our room had a phone number of a pizza place that was kind of like the one that delivered to that hotel. And so on the way back, we, we, we called it in, Googled it, called it in, picked it up, and we got to the hotel. And when I get to the hotel, I opened the, the pizza box, and I just uh, see a pizza that it was just with cheese. I don't know if it was missing ingredients. I can't remember that detail. But what I do remember is that the pizza was not cut in slices. It was just like the big chunk of bread with cheese on top. And so we got some plastic silverware, cut our slices, but I was mad because we had to wait. And then by the time we got there, I, you know, anyway, I'll come back to that story later. But, but I don't like waiting. And my gut tells me that you are a little bit impatient, too. Now, another thing that I don't like is drama. Uh, but I found out that it's inevitable. <laughs> You don't ask for it. It just finds its way, right? And somebody got offended, and somebody wants this, and somebody wants that. And then you realize that some people that you thought you could trust, you cannot trust anymore because their feelings were hurt because of this. Or I mean, it's just drama, right? And, and in the story, in the journey of David uh, to, the, to the kingdom, to becoming a king, the story is filled with drama. <laughs> David did not immediately succeeded uh, Saul and became king, he had to wait. We, we, we just read that there was a long war, that there was a, a rather a long conflict during which it was not really clear whose name would be next to be the king. Of course, David knew. We know because we read it, but just think about it then. Uh, and in reality, most of the people were like, okay, who's the next king? Of course, some people heard that maybe David was anointed, but really, it's been years. So who's next? Who's going to be the king? And what we find out is that David did not seize the kingdom. He didn't really fight for it. Uh, the kingdom, as I read somewhere, uh, somewhere 
someone wrote that the, the kingdom was rather a gift to David. And, and when David finally arrives at the place of uh, power over Israel, he is innocent. He, he doesn't have any blemishes on his record. He's legitimately the king established by God, and he kept his heart pure. And we know that David was a man after God's own heart. And so I wish there was a way around it, but we can't just skip through the story and find out that in the end David became king. <laughs> and so I'm going to do my best to just together, kind of like paraphrase, chapter 2 and chapter 3 of 2 Samuel. And for that, I really need you to stick with me. Just stay with me. Because if you're anything like me, sometimes you read these chapters and you just go and then just read name after name after name after name. And then who's who and then who killed who and then <sighs> David becomes king. <laughs> right? But in the course of this time after Saul died, David inquires from the Lord. He asks God to give him specific instruction as to where to go and what to do with his life. Shall I go up? He says, shall I go to this place? Shall I go to the towns of Judah? He asked, and the Lord said, go up. David said, where exactly shall I go? God says to Hebron, the Lord answered. David went up with his two wives and were given details about his two wives. And later he has another six wives. And, and he has a lot of children during this time. I think I counted 18 the last time I counted. But David just goes up. He's obedient to God. And, and, and David also takes men with him along with their families. And he goes up and he goes to the men of Judah. And uh, there they, the men of Judah, anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. And so he finds out that there are some other men that buried Saul. And we find the trait in Saul's life that he was always honoring. And, 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 and you got to understand that all these stories happening within a kingdom, within Israel. And so good things that happen make David's heart rejoice. But bad things that happen within the kingdom break uh, David's heart. You know, he, he's conflicted because the kingdom that he is about to rule over has to go through some transition and some conflict and some people die and some people betray and, and and along the pain is also the joy of the ultimate establishment of his kingdom over Israel but Israel has to suffer in order for Israel to be saved and so David blesses this man that uh, buried King Saul, and, and he says, May the Lord show you kindness, and, and, and I too will show you favor uh, because of the kindness that you show to Saul, your master, by bearing him. And, 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 and you know, David is just an honoring man. And so he says, But you got to be strong and brave because the people of Judah have anointed me king over them. Now, while David is solidifying his authority and his kingdom over this part of Israel, which is the, the southern part. The northern part is still uh, where Saul died. And, and, and Abner, the, the commander of Saul's army, starts to rise up. Now, names that you need to remember for this session. Abner is one of them. Abner is the commander of Saul's army. And we read in verse 8 of 2 Samuel chapter 2 that... Um, this commander takes Ishbosheth. Now, I don't plan on saying his whole name this whole entire time. So we're just calling him Ish. So Avner <laughs> takes Ish, son of Saul, and br brings him over to this place. And, and he, the commander, makes Ish king over several places, over Ephraim and Asuri and Jezreel and Benjamin and all Israel. And so, so Abner, the commander of Saul's army, kind of like, you know, tries to make, make uh, Ish happy by making him king over certain places. And we're told that the length of time that David was king is over seven years, was well, seven years and six months. And, and, and so interesting things happen along the story. Abner, uh, we're going to find out, has some interest, uh, some political interest. Perhaps he wants the benefit, or maybe he even wants to become king. Uh, 
I don't really know his motive, but his actions speak really loud in this story. And so Abner, uh, together with the men of Ish, he takes the, the, the men of, of the son of Saul, who he made king over certain places, uh, takes his men and, and, and he goes and meet uh, at the pool of Gibeon. And uh, he encounters another man. That's important for us to know. This man is Joab, and Joab is belonging to the house of David. So we have Abner, the commander of Saul's army, and we have Joab, who belongs to the house of David. And so they meet together by a pool, and Abner has this crazy idea, the first MMA fight in the history. Don't believe me? Verse 14 says, Abner said to Joab, let's have some of the young men get up and fight. Hand to hand in front of us. Guess what Joab said. All right, let them do it. So they stood up and they were counted off 12 men for Benjamin and Ish, son of Saul, and 12 for David. So you have 12 from the house of Saul fighting against 12 of the house of David. And it was Abner's idea. It was Abner's idea. Stay with me. Then each man, suddenly the fight turns violent. Then each man grabbed his opponent by the hand and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side. And they fell down together. So that place in Gibbon was called the field of daggers. I'm giving you the translation. Now, the battle that day, we're told in verse 17, was fierce. And Abner and the Israelites were defeated. Defeated by David's men because the house of David grew stronger and stronger as the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. And meanwhile, we have David waiting patiently for his time. Now, Joab had two brothers, we're told, and one of them liked to run really fast. And so this brother of Job starts chasing Abner, who had the idea of having the men fight. And now Abner is afraid, and he starts running for his life, while uh, Job's brother, Asael, starts chasing him. And so Abner, the one that wanted his men to fight, now is running for his life. And, and, and Abner tries to talk Asael into, you know, slowing down. Hey, why are you chasing me? Why are you chasing me? Let's stop the fight. And so Abner turns back. And he kills Asael, who is Joab's brother. We read in verse 23, Asael refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asael's stomach, and the spear came out through his back. He fell there and died on the spot. And every man stopped when he came to the place where Asael had fallen and died. Now remember, this man that just died is Joab's brother, who is the commander of David's army or David's men in this instance. And so Joab now starts pursuing along with his other brother. He starts chasing uh, Abner again. They start just going after Abner because Abner killed their brother. And so we find out that Abner, even though he first wanted to fight, now he's running for his life a second time. The first time, Joab's brothers chased him. Now, after he kills Joab's brother, Joab and his other brothers start chasing him too. And so Abner suddenly becomes uh, a peaceful maker. <laughs> first, he wanted to fight. And in verse 25, Abner called out to Joab and said, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their fellow Israelites? Why are we fighting? Wait a minute, Abner. You were the one that had the idea about the fight in the first place. And see, sometimes we do what is convenient. <laughs> we do what is convenient out of self-interest, right? And, and, and what's better for me and so... Joab, I guess Abner was good at speaking words and enticing people with his words because Joab stopped and he said, As surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued pursuing them until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet and all the troops came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did the fight, they fight anymore. 
And so suddenly there was some kind of peace because Joab stopped pursuing Abner and he assembled the whole army and he said, you know, let's, let's stop it. Now, what's important to notice here is that in verse 30, we are told that besides Joab's brother, Asael, 19 of David's men were found missing. So about 20 was the loss of uh, David's house. But then on verse 31, it says that David's men had killed 360 Benjamites who were with Abner. Because the house of David grew stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker. (laughs) And so they take Joab's brother and they bury him. And and that's how chapter 2 ends. Chapter 3, we find the verse where we started. The house of David grew grew stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Now, what's interesting is that we're told that the war between these two houses, the house of Saul and the house of David, lasted a long time. It says it lasted a long time, but we don't find another episode of of, of fighting or, or battles like this chapter again. And so I wonder if the fight became a fight of power and influence more than a war Uh, because we we see Abner trying to continue to entice David and so remember Abner has a self-righteous interest he first tries to uh, defend Saul and now he tries to fight against David but now he tells Joab no let's not fight let's keep the peace why do we keep killing each other we belong to the same nation now remember all this is happening without the ba- within the boundaries of Israel's kingdom these are God's people it's like when family and conflict <laughs> happen right it breaks your heart some Words were said, some things were done, and it hurts, but it's still family, and you gotta, you, you got to say together, this was the case, this is Israel's, this is God's people. David is to become the king over Israel, but in order for him to become, conflict must happen, and fights need to be fought, and people have to be killed along the way, and meanwhile, David is just waiting patiently, and so... You would think that at this point, Abner would just give up the fighting. But um, now we turn to chapter 3. And uh, in, in, in chapter 3, we are told that during the war between these two houses, the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. So it's not that he didn't really want to fight. It's that he was not ready to fight yet. So he was trying to strengthen his position in the house of Saul to maybe perhaps become the king or overtake the kingdom or fight on his own to take the kingdom. And so Saul had a concubine and Abner takes her as his own in order to make an expression or a demonstration that he's the next one in the list to become the king, right? And so Abner uh, is then accused by Ish. Do you remember Ish, the one that Abner made king over certain kingdoms? Well, Ish notices that Abner is trying to take possession of Saul's house, and he says, hey, Abner, slow down. What are you doing? And Abner, in verse 8, we're told, is very angry because of what Ish says. So he answered, am I a dog's head on Judah's side this very day? I am loyal to the house of your father Saul and to his family and friends. I haven't handed you over to David. Yet now you accuse me of an offense involving this woman? In other words, I'm playing victim now, right? You're accusing me. Now, all this time, probably Abner is not strength strong enough to even fight against Ish, the one that he made king over certain places. You see, Abner maybe made him king in order to get influence and to gain influence, but once Ish was against him, he was like, I'm in trouble, so I better run to where I can get some position and, you know, power. And so Abner now sends messengers to David on his behalf. And he now tries to entice David into believing that he wants David to become the king. 
The interesting thing is that a few verses before, we saw that Abner made his house stronger. So we don't know if he was trying to become king or not, but what we see, it's a, it's a constant self-preservation by the words and by the alignment to whoever has more power or more influence. And so Abner sends messengers to uh, David and he says, make an agreement with me and I will help you bring all Israel over you. Good, said David. See, David is not threatened by anything. He has his confidence in God, in God's timing, in God's power, in God's mighty hand to do what he said he would do in his life. And so he says, I will make an agreement with you, but I demand one thing, that you bring me back my wife, who is Saul's daughter, who was given to me, but then taken from me. So he sends Abner to go and brings his wife. And he also, David also at the same time, asks Ish to send back his wife. So he tells them both. Now, we don't know why he did it with both. If he had already asked Abner to bring back his wife, why would he tell Ish to bring his wife? This sounds like a TV show or a movie, right? And so they bring back his wife. Maybe David did it in both sides so that neither one would think that had more, you know, uh, authority or influence over him that, that he was who he was and that he was confident in his own strength. And so at this time, Abner, verse 17 of chapter 3, conferred with the elders of Israel and said, For some time you have wanted to make David your king. Now do it. For the Lord promised David, by my servant David, I will rescue my people, Israel, from the hand of the Philistines. And from the hand of all their enemies. So suddenly Abner becomes spiritual. And the interesting thing is that even those that are far from God know that God is God. So Abner also spoke to the Benjamites in person. Then he went to Hebron to tell David everything that Israel and the whole tribe of Benjamin wanted to do. When Abner, who had 20 men with him, came to David at Hebron, David prepared a feast for him and his men. David was being nice, y'all. Abner said, let me go at once and assemble all Israel for my Lord, the king. You got to remember, like, you skimmed through the story and you, you oversee things. But David is, I mean, Abner is being nice to David when a few verses before Abner was making his men fight against David's men. What a change of heart. Did he have good intentions? Well, I think it was self-preservation, right? I, I, I want to stay alive, and I want to continue to have influence, and I want to have power, and I'm willing to go out uh, to do whatever it takes, lie if I have to, deceive if I have to, steal if I have to, kill if I have to, because it's all about me. <laughs> and so when Joab, at verse 23, and all the soldiers with him arrived. Now, Joab is the one loyal to David, to the house of David, right? It's the one whose brother was killed by Abner. Joab returns to David, and he finds out that Abner has been talking to David. And he tells David, David, what have you done? Verse 24. Look, Abner came to you. Why did you let him go? Maybe he even told him, did you know that he made his men fight against our men and we had to kill over 300 of his men because he was trying to grow his house stronger, maybe to overtake and to overrule or, or to, to not make you king. And now he's lying to you. Why did you let him go? Now he's gone. He came to deceive you, verse 25, and observe your movements and find out everything you are doing. So Joab then left David and he sent messengers after Abner. Joab, the one from the house of David, is now chasing again Abner, who belonged to the house of Saul, who was now trying to become uh, on the side of, uh, be uh, accomplished to, to the house of David. And so Joab took him aside, verse 27, into an inner chamber as if to speak with him privately and there to, and there to avenge the blood of his brother Asael. Joab stabbed him in the stomach, and he died. Now, was Joab told by David what to do with Abner? No. 
Did he receive any instruction as to how to handle Abner's situation? Maybe Joab was not that wrong in perceiving the deceitful spirit in Abner's heart, but he acted out of authority and he did what he thought was best. And so he avenged his brother's life and he killed Abner without David even knowing. And so David heard about this and he said, I and my kingdom are forever innocent before the Lord concerning the blood of Abner, son of Nair. And I wonder how many times we do things on our own without consulting God and without asking God really what to do about it. And then when things don't work out, we turn to God and God says, that's not on me. That's on you. But God, why did you allow me to go through this? I did, you did it. <laughs> and so David's heart is broken he says, may his blood fall on the head of Joab and his whole family. May Joab's family never be without someone who has a running sore or leprosy or who leans on a crutch or who falls by the sword or who lacks food. And all I learned from this is that choices have consequences. And so then David said to Joab and all the people with him, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and walk in mourning in front of Abner. King David himself walked behind the bear, and they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. All the people wept also. You have to remember, all this is happening within the same nation, Israel. Of course, some people were loyal to Abner, and their hearts were broken when he died. And David, David loves Israel. He's to become the king over Israel, but his heart is broken because of the conflict within it. But that conflict is necessary for him to become king. And so then they all came and urged David to eat something while it was still day. But David took an oath saying, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely. If I taste bread or anything else before the sun sets. And all the people took note and were pleased indeed. Everything the king did pleased them. So on that day, verse 37, all the people there and all Israel knew that the king had no part in the murder of Abner, son of Ner. Bad things happen in our world. And we make a huge mistake when we blame God for them. <laughs> it breaks his heart to see the brokenness so much so that he became flesh. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we can turn to him so that he could redeem us and make us new and give us a new purpose and a new heart. But he will not allow self-righteous people with an interest on their own to get on the way of him becoming king. You see, he is king. He's king of kings. His kingdom is advancing. His kingdom is here, yet not ready here. But we don't have to help him without asking him one to, what to do. We do and we say and we walk and we talk and we behave the way he guides us through his Holy Spirit to honor him, but not for our own. And so then the king said to his, his, his men, Do you not realize that a commander and a great man has fallen in Israel this day? And today... Though I am the anointed king, I am weak. And these sons of Zeruiah are too strong for me. May the Lord repay the evildoer according to his evil deeds. And chapter 3 ends. And we'll pick it up next week. <laughs> Drama, right? You think, well, David just became king and that's it. But there are a lot of lessons that we can learn. Now we have to be careful with these kind of books because we can make too much of a <laughs> application to where we get it out of context. I think just the principles are there that some people are deceitful, that some people take sides for their own agenda, and that's a reality, and we all know it, and we all see it. But we're not to point fingers. At where we're to point fingers at us. Why, what am I fighting for? What is, it, what is it really that I want out of this life? So there are just a few things that I want to point out. The first one is that skill and experience will overcome self-reliance and ambition. Last week we talked about ambition. 
sacred ambition. But if that ambition is a selfish ambition, it goes contrary to God's desires for your life. And so skill and experience will often overcome self-reliance and ambition. We see this in the life of David from the beginning. When he fought Goliath, it was not because of a selfish desire or ambition. It was because he was skilled and he had the experience. He had been tending sheep and fighting lions and bears. And he had the skills to defeat the enemy for God's glory. But in Abner, the one, the commander of Saul's army, we have a typical example of a person who have vested interests they are after power and privilege and position such people attach themselves to a certain party to a certain side to the winning side it doesn't matter at what cause the team is winning i just want to be in the winning team and i don't care if we cheat i don't care if we deceive i don't care if we take if we kill i i, I don't care at what cost i just want to be in the winning team and, and and not because they're committed with their policies or what they believe they just want power and they just have selfish interests in their mind but when they realize that those interests are in danger they change their loyalty remember abner let's fight against the house of david no, let's not fight. Why are we keeping killing each other? No, David, we'll make you king. No, David, like just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Army commanders often become a threat to kings and governments. Now, the second thing is that God's intentions may be delayed, but cannot be defeated. David had been anointed king, and he would become king. Now do it. Even Abner knew it in verse 18. Now do it for the Lord promised David by my servant David. I will rescue my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. You see, David's calling as king is not because of any special virtue or cleverness on his part. But it is for the purpose of saving God's people. You were called not because of you, but because of the people that through you will know about God's love. The team can get ready. Covenant making has an important place in David's reign. It was expected that Israelite kings, unlike the nations around them, should rule with their people's support by making a covenant with them. Now, such covenants are obviously between the Lord and the king and the people, but also between the king and the people. <laughs> and so David, he's not in a hurry to manipulate, to twist arms or to oppress people in order to gain power. He wins them to his side rather than by exercising his arbitrary authority. And isn't that God's heart? I mean, sometimes I'm like, God, if you wanted to, you just could, you just could do it. You just could take over. But yet you're patient. Sometimes we end up hurting each other and talking about each other and hurting each other and the world is broken and it breaks God's heart. But he's your king. His intentions may be delayed. He has good plans for you. <laughs> but his intentions will not be defeated. Now it is difficult to imagine David, even at his most cynical, wanting a massive defeat over Israel or of Israel in order to advance his own interests. In other words, you know, at the same time that, that, that he sees the damage that it's caused, he, he doesn't want that to happen because at the same time he, he, he has a desire to become king so that he can rule over that kingdom according to God's heart. You know, after we went back to the hotel room and opened up that pizza, the whole <laughs> chunk of cheese on top of bread. 
I got kind of mad. And so I picked up the card from the hotel because we had just entered the room and called them right away. And I said, blah, 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 like very calm. <laughs> they apologized immediately. 10, 15 minutes, we had someone at the door, right? Two pizzas and dessert. <laughs> Great. We were already full because we had cut the other one, but we still ate more pizza. <laughs> I went in the shower, and while I'm in the shower, I, I, I hear the door again. And then Norma comes and says, hey, they came back again with more pizza. <laughs> but I told them, no, that, was a, that, that we, were, we were good. I said, good, good for them, right? When I get out of the shower, I, I looked at the, the pizza that we just ate, and I see the Pizza Hut bugs, and then I... Look at the other pizza and dessert, and they are from Domino's. I complained with the wrong pizza place. <laughs> and we got pizza. <laughs> you see, what happens is that on the way back initially, we just Googled the pizza place, and I thought it, I had seen Pizza Hut, but it was Domino's. I mean, it was... I thought it was Domino's, but it was Pizza Hut. Anyway, I got them confused, okay? <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't get what you want. And you may complain a little bit and even pray. And you don't deserve it. But God comes back and he says, here's a blessing. Here's another blessing, right? Grace, after grace, after grace. How much longer are you going to fight for what you think you want and you need? He's king. Whether you admit it or not, he's king. And one day, every knee will bow down and recognize that he's king of kings. Why not now? <laughs> Why not now? God is calling some of you to go deeper, to get real with God today, not tomorrow, today. Some of you are struggling with addictions that maybe nobody even knows. God wants you free. He sees the pain that it causes in your life. Some of you are still fighting resentment and talking about people and hurting people and, and, and they did it. And, 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 and. We fight each other, but God's heart is broken because of our inability to just make him king. We're going to move into a time of anointing. David was anointed. Not because my throat is a little bit tired and and I don't have much more to say. I've asked Pastor Larry to guide us into this moment of anointing because some of you need to get serious with God today. God has been steering your heart. And he's calling you deeper. <laughs>